Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show those two scamps behind Great America, Darren and Graham. As is often the case with podcasts, this one was recorded two and a bit, two and a half weeks ago. One unique reason for the delay on this episode was there were so many dropouts <laughs> on the Zoom call, which has never happened before. So I actually needed more than a day to edit this one, which I didn't have until today. Um, anyway, you will hear them in there. That's up. <laughs> You'll hear the dropouts in there. I need to mention that right off the bat. But the other thing, as you all know, in 2020, two and a half weeks is 11 whole years of famine, drought and brigands. So we recorded this around the peak of the, shall we say, highly suspicious outbreaks of violence during the BLM protests. And, you know, Chaz has been and gone since then. Right. So the examples in our discussion um, have taken on if not a different, then an additional meaning in the intervening time. You see, I wanted to talk about how we talk about things like UFOs or grimoires or telepathy or whatever when faced with the discursive singularity that is 2020. The, which is to say the apparent impossibility of talking about anything else. Now, I've settled it to my own satisfaction in the past week or so by realizing I'm going to talk to whoever the fuck I want to. Uh, and that might sound obvious if you're not podcasting or vlogging or whatever, but actually it isn't. And, and Darren and Graham share their own feelings around that realization too. As far as I can tell, that realization doesn't come from thinking like one show or another is important. I mean, honestly, imagine thinking podcasts are important, but from a very real human place uh, in terms of the hosts not wanting to add more hurt into a hurting world. And so that's kind of where the, um, the almost like the editorial decision making comes from, as far as I can tell. And I'll touch more on this in the outro, but parts of this moment that are also an op contain within them the dangerous idea that you cannot look away, that you must not speak about anything else. And once again, in that situation when solving how we talk about talking about things, the obvious answer doesn't work, which is if part of the op is to continually center the op narrative, then don't talk about it, right? Nope. Because again, <laughs> however weaponized they may be, the underlying issues are both urgent and real. So to not talk about it also drops you back in that editorial challenge of not wanting to cause hurt and polarization. So I needed to talk to some people about talking. And the Grimerica boys are an obvious choice for the key reason that their perspectives are both different and similar. Different in the sense that there just aren't too many working class voices in, I don't know, crypto paranormal podcasting or podcasting in general, frankly. And a lot of people miss the value and importance in that. And also similar in the sense, which is totally selfish on my part, that I needed to talk about talking with some, I guess, Commonwealth brothers, <laughs> because it's not just... Part of the op um, is to command the entirety of one's attention. It's also that this collapse is going on at the center of one empire, and me, Darren, and Graham happen to live on the outskirts of two. So there's a particular perspective um, that I was looking, uh, from my own experience, that I was looking to hold up uh, against similar but different perspectives in that context, right? Bit of a lengthy introduction there, um, but I wanted to hit the two important points that this episode has a lot of dropouts, uh, which I did my best to stitch together. And also that one of the reasons that talking about talking is so hard in 2020 is how quickly 
everything is changing. You know, but we also talk about chickens and UFOs and all that kind of zany stuff. So enjoy. Darren and Graham, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having us on. It's an honor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be fun. And uh, and I kind of know some of this from listening to the show, um, at least in Graham's case. But who wants to go first with the traditional first question? Darren and Graham, were you weird kids? Mm, I don't think I was a weird kid. No, nah, maybe I was a weird Yeah, I was probably a weird kid a little bit. A little bit of a weird kid. My mom was, you know, my mom will be here tomorrow. It's too bad I could have asked her. She would probably say yes. What would she say? Was it weird because you were just reading strange stuff? Did you have scary imaginary friends, something like that? I think I was a bit of a troublemaker and um, I was good at disappearing into the bush and just being gone for longer than I should have been and getting into trouble getting into trouble i i believe that of you darren um so whereabouts did you you said get into the bush like where did you grow up i grew up in northwestern ontario so probably like i I know when i grew up there was the most northern stoplight in ontario which is our biggest province and i think it's still the most northern 18 hole golf course i mean once you get past my place, like it's pretty my thick. hometown, there's yeah. like nothing there. It's we're in the bush, the bush, yeah. bush. It's mostly just Indian reserves. Amazing. So, um, the the northernmost golf course in the world. No, it was just in Ontario. Okay, right, that, right. yeah, so because there's, it's got to be some some crazy rich person's got to have one like in the actual Arctic. <laughs> yeah, well, plus then we've still got like Nunavut and Northwest Territories. Yeah, that now cool. I'd imagine. They probably got golfing like 24 hours a year in the summer up there. True. <laughs> off at 11 yeah. p.m. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Well, actually, I can't stand golf, but I mean, I think if you liked it, 24-hour golf would be pretty sweet. I so, sold um, my golf clubs this year, actually, and bought a meat grinder instead. Uh, well, that's a good 2020 move. You know, we might all, we might all be <laughs> homesteading one way or the other. Seemed like good timing to get some homesteading equipment. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, is that something you guys, did you, if you were like a bush kid, is that how you were raised? I mean, how did, how do you go from being someone who would be, maybe be a little bit of a truant out in the, uh, out in the bushlands in Ontario to uh, co-hosting a show like Grimerica? Like the, at some point, something, something either has gone very wrong or very right there. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, if I wouldn't have met Graham, there's no way I would have ended up podcasting. I don't think it just wouldn't have happened. He was just, I mean, so I came out here, you know, chasing work and the American dream or whatever the fuck that is, you know, and this is sort of where we ended up. Maybe I found it in sort of a backward sense. It wasn't at all what I was looking for at the time. But I mean, I was just out here sort of working and stuff and kind of had sort of forgotten completely the, of, you know, because I grew up eating fish, you know, a couple nights a week, you know, that's like a measurable percentage of my diet is fish that was caught at the lake and everyone was eating moose meat all the time. And my grandma was like, I remember still my grandma was straight up like growing food and, and preserving it and jarring it. And like, so her, she had her huge garden in the backyard and it was still like, you know, the supermarket experience was very new to her. And I mean, we were in the middle of nowhere. So even like getting to the supermarket in the 80s, you weren't finding a lot of stuff there. You know, it was like that prototypical three or four channels and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, so I came out here for work, met Graham. Within a year or two, we were probably had a podcast going. Uh, a year, probably a year and a bit, I think. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, right away, you you were into the mysterious. Right away, we clicked on ancient mysteries and alternative history, really, and that was enough to, you know, that kind of just starts expanding into all kinds of stuff. Mysterious. I mean, universe, how, how yeah. did you guys? Because it's it's slightly different backgrounds. But how did you guys meet? Did you like reach for the same book in the library about Bigfoot? I mean, what happened? No, we were in uh, at work together, and somebody said, "You guys should actually talk to each other," you know, because you know we. You're kind of interested in these crazy things. <laughs> and now we still work together. Yeah. And now we do a podcast together too. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. Nice one. So yeah. like 
um, at some stage, then Darren, from Bush kid to being interested in 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 Grimerica content, at least like the weird stuff, like the UFOs and Bigfoot stuff. You kind of mentioned there's a there's a background in there's already a family background in like the almost like the politics of place. I guess is a good way of thinking about it. But um, at some stage, did you? Because I know Graham's got this going on for him. But like, was there? Um, did a dead relative visit you, or did, was there any of that kind of stuff, or was it just an intellectual interest? Like, you know what? I think uh, I think there's something to this UFO stuff, or whatever. Yeah, it's more of an intellectual interest. I mean, the UFO stuff still to this day doesn't really, you know. I mean, and which is kind of ironic because it was ancient aliens that sort of re-gripped me into the whole thing, that kind of pulled me out of my you know, my 20s partying stupor that we all sort of fall into in the early 20s where we're just chasing women and partying and chasing down parties. At least some of us fall into that trap. And um, and then I came out of that and I've started watching at the same time I met Graham and we're, he's got me listening to Mysterious Universe. And through that, I found the Micah Hanks show. And, and at the time, I was watching tons of Ancient Aliens. And the first two seasons of Ancient Aliens, I still maintain are like, you know, Giorgio gets a little crazy. Giorgio is also a bit of an asshole, but that's a different story. Um, but those first two seasons, Ancient Aliens, are really, there's some really compelling stuff in there for some ancient mysteries. And that's kind of always been, that's what really gets me going is sort of that where did we come from? Because it seems like there's a giant missing something. Yeah, it's, it's a, it, it it's perfectly fine to defend ancient aliens in that sense. I'm ex discovery channel and um, all these kind of multi-channel networks like history and discovery and whatever, when they hit on a format that works like, um, you know, fishermen in dangerous seas that can kind of go forever. They're like jackpot. And that's, that's the thing with ancient aliens, which is why it gets so terrible <laughs> as the years go on. It's like, but we make, this is like the only thing that makes us money. So the first two are kind of like a real show. And then after that, it's like, and now we're going to do cathedrals. Um, yeah, we're, we're sort of getting into the 18th century. Did the aliens build this now? And it does not, um, it's not as good. <laughs> I think I've seen one where the aliens are shooting dinosaurs with lasers. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I'd watch that. I, I think that'd actually be all right. <laughs> they, were, they, they were killing the dinosaurs to pave the way for humans. Right, right. That is a that's a bold claim. All right, cool. Well, that's actually a pretty good point to tee it up and then throw the question over to Graham. Weird kid, yay or nay? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, the 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 thing that made me think I could be weird is is um well well I was friends with like a lot of different groups of people, which is interesting. So we had little cliques in in school when I was a kid in junior high and high. Like we had the jocks and the kind of the rockers and the punk people and the nerds. Kind of like it's pretty cliche, but there was these little groups of people, but we were sort of friends with all of them. Like I had sort of ties with all of them, did all different things. But then we ended up, uh, my parents let me paint my, my bedroom. So I had Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd lyrics all over the bedroom and just weird graffiti and symbols and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, I think that's kind of weird, I guess. I mean, the, not, not many people were able to just decorate the room, have their friends over and crank some music in these huge speakers and just sort of have your way with the walls. Yeah, true, true. Um, and also it's kind of, I'm not exactly sure how old you are, but it's also, um, it, you, weren't playing, you weren't playing 80s music when this happened. <laughs> uh no exactly <laughs> exactly that's i love <laughs> i do like the 80s music though but then we were listening to older music probably like the 70s stuff you know the 70s stuff but and then i played a little dungeons and dragons so that that sort of fed into my interest of the fantasy realm and magic and and uh all this kind of stuff i played a little bit of that and I'm back into that again but that was something that that hit pretty strong as a kid the the uh the creativeness and the and the uh, <clears throat> the full immersion of of that imaginary game. Well, that's a good point. So, I mean, if you if you look at someone like Dr. Kripal's work, um, there's always like a library or book incident. Do you guys um, remember? I think for <laughs> yeah. me, it was probably reading as a teenager. Of, of all the magic books, I think it was once I got to Cosmic Trigger that um, I'm like, hmm, this was. I, I, we can't. I can't. I will never use the term like like a red pill incident, but this was it. This was a moment where I'm like, oh, this is going to be my jam. Do you guys remember there was if there was something like that for you? 
Uh, the Lord of the Rings was pretty pre- prevalent for me. And my, I remember my dad had uh, Jacques Vallée books. And, really? uh, yeah, and the fourth way. And so he, thinking back now, I'm like, geez, my dad had some real sort of esoteric stuff and then some UFO stuff. And he had a book, uh, The Psychic Warrior, on audio back then. So there was some uh, interesting, interesting things I remember from my dad's library. What about you, Darren? You know what? <clears throat> You know, a book was, was great back in the day that just kind of made, made my mind sort of start working on that ancient mysteries or where did we come from sort of thing was the chrysalids. And I can't remember who wrote it. I actually think I have the audio book, so I could probably tell you who wrote it. But it was kind of like this. I, I don't even want to say what the plot was because the plot, you don't really figure out the exact plot for like half the book until you really figure out what's going on there. But um, it was an interesting thing on, on maybe how, <clears throat> how quickly the, how quickly civilization can change, and how, um, you know, it might not always be what you what you think. Well, I have way too many audio books. Well, that's uh, uh, well, that's a book for for now. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's why I bought the audio book was because I was hoping my kids could get into it, but they're just a little too young yet. I think I read it. We read it in school back then. So I think I read it around grade eight or so. Um, yeah, fair enough. I That'll can't. do it. That's about when it's about when I hit uh, Cosmic Trigger. And that was a good one for me because it was um, kind of like a Cliff Notes version of the 60s and 70s, right? Because it's Bob Wilson stuff, but also, wow, there's all these other things that go next to Lord of the Rings and dabbling in magic and ghosts and, and what have you. And it, 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 I just kind of knew that there could be that kind of coherent sort of world. But like, Graham, you had, um, you saw some stuff at, at some stage. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, even, even, as, yeah, even as a kid, I remember, I remember, uh, the girls that we were hanging out with playing with the Ouija board in high school quite a bit. And then I remember uh, my friend had a, a haunted turret and, and we were up there actually at the time we were up there smoking some, some weed. We were, I think we were, must've been 15 or 16. And we took some pictures of, of a ghost. Like there was prominent cummerbund, uh, glowing cummerbund and orbs. And this turret was supposed to be haunted. And my girlfriend and I took the pictures to her mom and her mom was like, just leave this stuff alone. Like she was kind of warning us against the whole thing and it, and the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and dropped, but we were all really excited there for a while that we'd actually captured what this, everybody knew was the ghost of this tour. And then in 1990, traveling around Europe uh, in the Middle East uh, in Israel, I was on the top of a rooftop hostel and I saw uh, I saw a UFO up there. I, I came onto the rooftop and a bunch of my friends were all pointing up and yelling at the sky and exclaiming. So I ran over to them like, what's going on? And they said, we see this UFO when it went over here and it did this 90 degree turn. And I was so upset that I missed it. I was looking up saying, please come back, please come back. I want to see you too. And then I spotted it and it was a polygonal. Like now thinking about sacred geometry and the shape of this thing, it was pretty much a dodecahedron or maybe an icosahedron split in half and the halves were rotating against itself and the whole thing was rotating slowly on its axis and it just went in the moonlight straight silently across the sky and i was like hey is this is that what you guys saw and they're like yeah yeah that's the one we saw and i mean that just 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 going through my mind thinking that's not a plane it's not a satellite it's not it's it's this weird shape it's flying silently like and and the only other time so that got me like Thrust me right into sort of the UFOs back then. And the only other one I saw of that shape was a lady in Israel on sightings, actually, back in the early 90s. There was something about that. But that, that, sort, of, uh, that sort of got me into, into that. And to have that consciousness aspect of it where I asked it to come back, and it did, I guess, or, or I noticed it again or whatever. But that, that was a pretty weird one. Yeah, that's good. Does that stay with you like... Um... Was it a moment, a galaxy brain moment of not necessarily I'm going to dedicate my life to this, but it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be about this for a while. Do you know what I mean? Was, there, was, it kind of, was that enough to be like, or are you sort of as surprised <laughs> as anyone else that this is how your life has turned out? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I was, I was about that for a while back then. And then, and then I got, I got uh, distracted by 
corporate life and booze and drugs and this whole other thing. Like I got, it, it took me down a spiritual path at first as well. I was learning about uh, transcendental meditation and some other stuff, but then, but then I lost all that uh, at some point. And then getting sober 12 years ago, a couple months ago, uh, it really kind of brought everything back again. Like the whole, the whole thing, the spirituality, the, the esoteric, the UFOs, all that stuff. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah. What about you, Darren? Was that was there anything? Was it just a background interest, and then actually Graham was your red pill in a way? <laughs> yeah, probably in a lot of ways. And I mean, I can't give enough credit to Ben Grundy over at Mysterious Universe because I mean, I devoured all of their. At that time, I want to say they were six or seven seasons into the podcast, and I devoured it all inside a couple of months and that was like so i mean i was coming from really the ancient aliens there was a couple things i had learned about as a kid like the bermuda triangle and a couple of those like big mysteries but i hadn't even considered stuff like the pyramids might be you know the narrative might be bullshit on any of that stuff until ancient aliens and really um podcast going through all of mysterious universes back catalog and then I mean, at that time, I wouldn't even been to, I, so I didn't even figure out that the 9-11 was a fucking, an anomaly until I think I started really listening to Carl Wood show. You know, it was after we started the podcast that, you know, and then all of a sudden I've got all this shit getting thrown at me from all directions, which is, you know, in some ways a blessing and in other ways a curse. And I mean, so that's when I really started taking a look at 9-11 and stuff like that. Some of this stuff is just since I've started the show where I'm just like, wow. So that'd be the last seven, oh, yeah, seven, like, seven years. Like, my, like learning about, you know, the CIA control in the news and how we can't trust any of the news networks. And I mean, really, it's just, you can't trust any of it. As far as I can tell, everything's fake. The news, the narrative, the history. I don't even know where to fucking begin. Well, that's a good, like, because one of the questions was going to be, oh, well, it's, it's a double question. I'll get you both to answer it. Um, what's changed in the show from like episode one that you set out to do? Um, because as you say, Darren, you were just like, well, I'm I was just kind of here for the ancient aliens, and then all of a sudden <laughs> it's everything else. So that's question the first. The second one, which is related to it, is what's changed in your worldview the most, like since starting the show? So who wants to go first on that? I'll go first, I guess. So well, politically, I think. When I started the show, I was probably more on the left. And about halfway through the show, I was probably more on the right. I mean, which can be evidenced by the shows in our back catalog where I'm telling people that Trump's going to save the world. And uh, well, Did you ever say that? Did you? Well, I well you said he was going to win. Well, you said he was gonna, you... No, I think I was actively thinking. For a while there, I was on the train that Trump was going to... But that was before he was elected. Things up. Oh, yeah, now I'm them completely yeah. off that train. Yeah. But that would have me on the right there for, yeah, so for yeah. a while. And I was pretty conservative-leaning. And I mean, libertarian, in a way, libertarian. Right? I was a registered libertarian up until <laughs> a couple of years ago. To the in point, Canada, are you even allowed? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like a pointless endeavor, but I was paying you know, so many bucks a year for my libertarian membership. And it's funny because they actually last year, they emailed me to see if I was interested in being a candidate in, the, in a certain riding. And I was just like, I can't even listen to you guys talk anymore but you're indian you, you'd be you'd, go, you'd be a shoe in right away oh, yeah, well, there's still like, no yeah there's Darren, still my, mind went, my mind went right there like you would be i don't you should stand for something I pick a party it doesn't matter <laughs> that would uh well, that currently would make... i'm entertaining just a new party because i don't no, think they... any of the parties that we have really work but i do think we're ready for that in a lot of ways like you know what it is is i got these fucking chickens and I know it's just a matter of time till they tell me I can't have these chickens. And that's what's going to wake me up. And I'm going to, because I was ready to run for the town council a couple of years ago. And it's just like, that's too much work. But if they tell me I can't have my chickens, I'm going for a town council. I don't know where that's going to end. But now I think that, so I think they're all fascists. I think that the left and the right is all just a bunch of theater for the military industrial complex. And I think that most of the Western governments are in on it. And they're all a bunch of fascists. That's the plan. They, they feed us fake news. It's all, they just keep marching down that road to world domination. 
and they feed us a bunch of crap along the way to keep us in fighting. And if they really cared about, you know, brown lives and black lives, they'd stop fucking dropping bombs on Palestine and Yemen and places like that all around the world every single goddamn day. The whole thing for most of the Western governments, it's all um, theater for the military industrial complex. And if they gave a shit about anyone, it, these are my words. Yes, they wouldn't be bombing Arab children into paste. And, uh, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and so what I did say in response was, so Darren started off maybe looking at hieroglyphs that might show a Black Hawk helicopter and then ended up some sort of pacifist, anarchist, um, chicken wrangler thinking about running for local council. And I'm like, that seems about right. That seems about right when you, when you knock on these doors. Pretty much. And I own more guns than I expected to. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I wanted, I wanted to qualify the pacifist thing. It's um, we get the guns, they don't get the guns. <laughs> that should be how it goes. Pretty much. That would be make the world a much better place. I mean, I think we've even got Graham ready to go out and try out some guns. Oh, that's your turn, Graham. How did how have you like what did you expect of the show to start? And and how what's the thing that's changed the most about you? Um, as a result of doing it, you think? Well, how you we, see did, the we didn't really have a lot of expectations or I didn't have a lot of expectations at the beginning. I wanted to talk to interesting people about UFOs and spirituality and all that stuff. And that went fan. I mean, it went fantastic. I mean, we couldn't have asked for a better, a better uh, seven years really for the show, but the, but some of the stuff and then that, they, it ends up being a, a war on consciousness. I mean, all the topics that we talked about, which was whatever we're interested in, which is everything from consciousness to, you know, magic and UFOs and, big foot and the deep state or whatever conspiracies sort of blend into that whole thing. But for me, it's been a, a different sort of awakening over the last couple of years or a few years as I get more into the esoteric stuff and the secret teachings and, and, you know, magic and, and, and reading sort of books that go back into the couple last few thousand years with the sort of secret societies and the bloodlines. And for me realizing that, that the global power, like when I, when I, when I grew up, I thought we were done with war. I thought, Hey, we've learned like there's, I was really naive and I was like, there's, there's we're in peace. Like you can, you can say stuff, but you can't be violent, you know, that we're not going to be in wars anymore. We've learned a lesson. Like I've had this sort of view of the future. And now that I, I look back and realize that all the wars, like that we were talked about with Thaddeus Russell, it started on lies. And there's no reason to think that there's not going to be more of that in the future. And the more you look back into reading these books and listening to guests that talk about the history, which I was never interested in before, but realizing that, yeah, the lies and the global power structure that's been there for a lot longer than I ever thought. And it's, and it's still trying to run the show probably more than ever now. They're kind of doubling down on everything. So I've had these levels of awakening about really the global power structure, I guess, over the last few years that I wouldn't have expected. Yeah. I like, it's funny, you started that with the, the war on consciousness and it's almost like um, be, between the two of you, um that that's it's the same war and your current kind of focus is on almost like the spiritual component or the uh mental component and and darren's was more explicitly the like um, the, <laughs> the physicality of it um but i i know what you mean like i i i started my show to just basically talk to my friends who do magic and um and that, it's been a tremendous journey and it's ended up in some different places as well. But that's a good, like, I, I want your professional opinion on the next question. Like, did either of you suspect doing, maybe not necessarily a conspiracy show, but like a conspiracy adjacent podcast would get so fucking real? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it makes you wonder if you just, if we're just accidentally manifesting this mess. I mean, it really does. Because it just seems like when I started looking at conspiracies, they just, you know, now I'm surrounded by them. I'm, they're telling me to stay in my house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're questioning it. I mean, I'm torn between gratefulness for this community, people like yourself, Gordon, and the other people that we're connected to and that we listen to and that are in our chats and the people that we can just be completely ourselves and we can say what we feel and what we want. And there's no real judgment and they know how we are as people. And then, between you know great great gratitude for that and then also super disappointment at 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 
other people, the, my, my other friends or my, my family's friends who they have to deal with this, this level of, um, I, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be mean about it either. Right. But it's just that there, there's no questioning on anything. They're just, they're just blindly going along with, with the mainstream narrative, which you can easily prove by using their own videos and their own data that, that they're completely lying. And when my sister challenges me on like, well, how do you know that that's real? Like, how do you know? And I'm like, well, I don't know what's real necessarily, but I know that that is fake. Like I can prove that they're lying all the time. It's pretty easy by using their own information that they're lying. That doesn't mean I have the answer or I know what the actual truth is, but I can point out that that's not true. And that's become sort of like the realness of this, of this, this challenge is how do we navigate that, that emotional thing? And I'm thinking to myself, like, I don't know if I have enough to offer. I don't know if I have enough to offer in the show. The show has always been about guests and about, but now we, we are kind of, now mixed in with all this and what are our opinions on this this latest conspiracy that is affecting us we have to stay at home we have to wear a mask where they maybe we, we're pretty lucky right now in alberta at least where i am there's like you know there's not a lot of people really following along with this whole this whole thing i feel yeah. like we're in a pretty free bubble in the world right now and i can't believe what's happening around it's us definitely like you know i was so gung-ho to try and get to the states as soon as possible and now i'm like yeah maybe new zealand don't seem so bad yeah new zealand's great but it has um um if if you find trudeau frustrating um don't move to new zealand <laughs> oh yeah this is the problem but i like that uh, i like the amount of people there you know i feel like there's 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 room to maybe push back on that in new zealand still whereas like Someplace like Canada is so big and sparse and well spread, so spread out. It seems like, you know, Alberta, maybe, you know, like my town seems doable. I mean, I seven, 800 votes and you're on the, on the city council. Yeah. I know, I know Alberta, what you mean. We don't, we don't have a 4 million people. That seems doable. I think New Zealand's around the same size, but now to, for me to make any sort of impression on anyone. We don't have a say federally at all. No, like we no, have no, zero say. we have no, in the West, we have no say on what happens for the country back east has all the pull but i want to get back to your question there because i don't know if we really answered it but i think if i was to be honest about that i think i would have wanted the show at the beginning to get real about conspiracies because we weren't fucking around at the time like i was we wanted to know the truth on ufos like there was things that i knew <laughs> overarching even Remember though karen hudez episode just blew our minds yeah she, and, st she started talking about pedo rings and this and that. My jaw's on the floor. I'm like, this lady is crazy. Can we even release this show? And then, <laughs> and then I would have, so I'd honestly think to say that I wanted it to be real. Now that it is real, I wanted to go back. very real. I don't know. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm pretty close to um, Greg. Like, I mean, I went to his wedding and yeah. everyone from High Side Chats, right? Yeah. And yeah. Um, it's... <laughs> It, it, you kind of put your finger on it there, Graham, which is like the show is about the guests, but now that we live in conspiratorial times, right? right? <laughs> um, it's sort of like, well, in fact, you have an expertise, an accidental expertise that might have some, like, you can say, like, listen, I've been talking to people who um, have been doing, whether I agree with it or not, outside the mainstream analysis for seven years. So I've got a bit of conspiracy foo you might, yeah. you might want to listen to it and and greg kind of is in the same boat where he's like hang on a minute i didn't it was never meant to be about me the world changed and now it's kind of exactly like turning to those who do um those who spent or who ended up with a career navigating alternate viewpoints and that's an expertise that we need because it's like well the main one i i know the the, the sadness you feel greg when um when you look at people you love who and it's and it's an emotional sadness because they're in a state of fear that they don't need to be in and and my my initial response to that is is kind of like an anger thing um which i get over fairly quickly because I'm like, well that's not going to help someone get out of a state of fear to like yell at a sibling <laughs> you know what i mean um but by the same token you're agitated because um it's almost like a misplaced fear it's like you're afraid i was of just gonna say that exactly isn't real and what i want you to do yeah. is have a measured amount of even not necessarily fear but wariness about an actual thing <laughs> yeah exactly and, uh, and and that's a skill it's a skills the wrong word it's almost too arrogant that is a learning from being in this world for for so long i think and that's probably i have this listen see what you think of this right so i didn't expect I don't think anyone who moved into conspiracy land 
Um, I did it for personal reasons, right? So I moved to London a couple of weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed. And so I was living, I was running out of money while the newspapers were saying things that were patently wrong. And I was going into um, job interviews with big corporations that I then found out in the newspaper the next day were calling up the Chancellor of the Exchequer to say, if you don't fix this, I can't pay my workforce of 100,000. And so that was my, um, I lost everything to failing to navigate a mainstream narrative. So right. that was my moment, right? And um, so I went into like, well, what I, you know, same thing, like what the shit's going on at NASA, 9-11, blah, 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 all fell after that. Cause I'm like, well, what the, what the fuck is going on? Right? So that was my moment. And I think for a lot of people that's happening now. And I have this theory, all this kind of, and, and Bob Wilson's a good example. And I mean this in a negative sense, like the cosmic trigger stuff. Um, was from the end of the Cold War and all the kind of 90s reality tunnel, hey, what about this kind of thing, even a bit, and I love Terence, but like even a bit of the Terence McKenna stuff happened after that end of history moment. So that once the Berlin Wall fell, we kind of have the the slacker 90s where it's sort of like, well, I guess I guess this kind of American version of capitalism is sort of what you're saying before, Graham, about like, I didn't think there'd ever be war again. Like, I guess it all kind of doesn't matter and we're all going to have this slacker capitalism life carrying on because it won. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so I think a lot of those, the harmlessness of, of conspiracy comes from there, where it's like, well, there's sort of nothing else to do but wonder if there are monuments on Mars, right? And, and I think a lot of people got into the world then, and here we are <laughs> a couple of decades later, and it's like, well, actually, it looks like those technocratic agendas are being pulled forward quite dramatically at the moment. And, and I think, what do we do? Like, I didn't expect it to get so real, but how, how do we, it's, it's a, a serious question, like, do we, responsibility is the wrong word, but like, what do we do? <laughs> Fix this for me. Yeah, I, I you agree. Gotta, you got to be the change, I think, right? That's all. I, the more I like boil down to it is like, I don't think we can tell people what to do because we're just sort of figuring it out as we go half the time. And, you know, if, if being the show, doing the show has taught me one thing, it's that I don't know fuck all. And if I think I got something figured out today, I should just watch because two years from now, that could be completely upended so I got to be real careful what I tell other people to do and I think the one that hits home is just like you know what I find that if I the things that you do just sort of naturally sort of overflow to the people that are closest to you in your life so if you just sort of you know go to a lifestyle where I'm trying to switch to more wild meat and abandon the fa factory farm system and you know have chickens and not do the egg system anymore and just sort of unplug from as many of those poisonous avenues as I can. And I mean, other than that, I don't know, other than, you know, just be kind to everyone as, as much as possible because this isn't, this isn't easy on anybody. And I mean, it's especially less easy if you, if you think the mainstream's telling you the truth all the time, then this is an even harder time. So all those people that we like to look at and call sheep and blah, blah, blah. I mean, they're having a way harder time of this than we are. I mean, for us, it's like an I told you so moment, or maybe we're pissed off at the government for a bunch of overreach. But I mean, there's a bunch of people that legitimately think that them and their love. There we go again. <laughs> So, I mean, people are comfortable in us to come to us and ask us questions about that stuff. Or sometimes we joke around with them about, you know, you throw, you throw those little bits out there in a joking way. That's something like it dropped out again. Yeah, it dropped out again, I think, um, while, while Darren was once again closing in on his rant, which um, this hasn't ever happened before. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm going to have to wow, cut that Wow, that's together. a good sign. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we're maybe we're dropping the right. Yeah, finish. we kept we kept talking anyways. Uh, well, yeah. fingers crossed. We saw it, you we drop off, so we just but, kept chatting to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. All right, that stopped again. Um, that's fine. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so we dropped out there again. Uh, well, Darren, I hope, or I believe, was um, closing in on his uh, on his wise rant or screed. Um, and I think it's funny, like, 
this comes back to how you, you, we fold the politics and the spirituality together, because after all this time, it turns out the thing we have to do, or the only thing we can do, or the best thing to do is what you find in literally every spiritual tradition everywhere, which is not to um, try to convince the world and impose your will on it, but to change you. Like the only thing that changes the world is for you to kind of go, well, I'm going to make the changes in my life. And, and it can only ever flow like kind of rhizomatically or, or horizontally from there. And it's funny, you, you can, I think if you can arrive at that either politically or spiritually, and you end up at the same place. It says something very important about whether we consider that a truth with a capital T, that this is in fact how we're supposed to live. Because obviously, you know, I'm down here doing the Permi Dream in Tasmania, which you guys, you know, you mentioned New Zealand, don't sleep on Tasmania. Um, you know, we're the same with apparently less reliable internet. Um, I think that's a really good point. But to kind of move it to what Graham was saying about how you kind of talk to family and so on. It seems to me, and I've been talking to the members about this, that we had the luxury of losing a world at the, at a different time to when a world is ending. So we had the opportunity to wake up to narratives being falsified or being false at a time when it wasn't, urgent <laughs> do you know what i mean and i think a lot of people yeah. are trying to do two things at once which is navigate and it doesn't even matter what you think is going on um i, I don't know a single person who thinks they're being told the truth like um by medical authorities or you know whatever and, and but the people who are just waking up to the idea holy shit powerful people lie to keep themselves in power at the same time <laughs> as holy shit the machinations of people in power is dramatically altering my world like unemployment and blah 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 or, or as you say, like arresting you in your house. Um, so they're trying to do two things at once, which we at least have the luxury of being able to do at separate times. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's where my, at least for friends and family, like my patience and sensitivity comes from. Like when the corona thing started, I did have to um, stop, not in an angry way, but I had to kind of like step away from talking regularly to my sister in France because she was having to navigate a lot of fear stuff at the same time. And I'm like, just relax, go through that. Because I would have, in an effort to try and engage her in conversation, it would have made it worse. So, um, yeah. yeah, and I don't, like it's a, it's a, yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect it to get so real, but I do think in a funny way, we have a peculiar responsibility that comes from, you know, a handful of years asking challenging questions. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And coming and coming at it from an honest and authentic place, I think is important. I mean, people that I know, they do come to me and to Darren and ask us what we think on certain things. And we, I usually purpose, I purposely kind of give a little bit of the extreme one. Sometimes I throw out uh, in a very, you know, loving, positive way the the more extreme example in a way, just to bring them back to the middle sometimes. And, and I'll do that in an, I'll still do that in an authentic way. I'm not trying to deceive anybody, but I'm, I'm sometimes pushing them, pushing the, the ideal a little bit farther than it, than I even believe just to, to try and to leave a lot of space in the middle for them to land. And uh, I think people start to, but I, like I was saying to Darren before it's, um, and I don't know if this was recorded or not when we dropped out, but it's, it is, I do question my, my uh, ability here to dig into any because i i just we scratch the surface on so many different topics i'm not really expert on anything so it's like sometimes i have to go through this like okay well maybe you can be of value for whatever that is whatever that means whatever two things i can connect together you know maybe it's just realizing that bill gates is the problem reaction solution that we've been hearing about so much you know he pumped money into wuhan he pumped money into imperial college and he's got money in the vaccines like he's got that whole cycle and maybe just opening up people to that might help a little bit well so i know what you mean about um, this is Greg's challenge as well. It's like, but I don't have an expertise in anything. And I'm like, well, you do. You have an expertise in, in asking the right questions to people who have an alternative critique. And I think crucially, and, and Darren kind of said this earlier, um, is to not 
necessarily believe as a result of that inquiring process. And I think though that's the yeah, exactly. second bit, because you're right, like we don't, um, both of you, we don't know shit. Like the three of us are absolutely wrong <laughs> in our analysis of whatever the fuck is going on um, at, a, at a sort of super elite or at least technocratic level, where at least between 80 and 100% wrong, which is fine because as Graham's point before, well, let's say 80 to 99%, and that's better than being 100% wrong, which is to, yeah. to follow it. And, and it's better not in a competition sense, but in a sense that, okay, I can derive actionable intelligence from this. I can, I, I can look at this and go, that's 100% wrong. I, I'm going to multi-scenario what I think is going on, and not just because it's a fucking hobby, but because it's a thing that is happening to me and my family, and so I, in fact, do need to um, adjust how I live accordingly. Like, what do I think is going on isn't just a 90s end of history question like it used to be. I think this is the trouble, right? Like, and, and it's certainly a real problem in conspiracy world. That's sort of why I, I, that I, I got to the end of the archaeology process and decided to my own satisfaction, I had a, a decent enough um, model for how a power elite or a predatory class works to live my own life. And that's turned out to be correct, right? Because most people, it doesn't matter, it's usually 9-11, but the first thing that they... Um, red pill on they get obsessed with for a yeah. number of years right now what do you think is going to happen <laughs> what do you, you think you're going to like solve it and march on Washington like there's no there's no end to it uh, on a on a macro basis it comes back to like well what what do you do with this practice it's like a a yoga of paranoia and it's it's to adjust your life accordingly. It's to go, okay, well, I'm, the, this is how power elites kind of always work, but I, the game is to see what their operation is as far as it interfaces with your life and, and adjust. And, and obviously I'm on the chicken train as well, Darren. So I, I, think that's, I think that's a big part of it. And even if the whole um, biopolitical up that's going on wasn't happening, it's still the right direction or trajectory surely is to sort of assert sovereignty over and and to detach from rockefeller medicine as much as possible and the industrial food supply as much as possible because wherever you look you're getting um crime frankly you're getting like a, a predatory class perpetrating crime for their own benefit in in all of these systems what do you think like a decentralization yeah. you got to decentralize yourself so that you know just take a right down a list of the people that your life is dependent on or the, the people or corporations that your life is currently dependent on. And then just see how that list makes you feel because it's not going to make you feel real good. I mean, some of them are going to be semi unavoidable, like our company probably and the water company and your, you know, your mortgage or your rent or whatever. But you know, there's some steps you can take out of there, whether it's your food supply or, you know, whatever. I mean, <clears throat> uh, you know, like I, I've got a few months of food on hand at all time, as I'm sure you do with your farm. And that's, you know, it's just like, so we're just that little level of thinking right there gets you sort of immune from the freaking the fuck out and running to the grocery store because you're going to run out of food in a week, which is a real fear if you've got a bunch of kids sure. or you know, whatever. But when that all started, because um, I had to kind of cut my um, London and Euro trip short because they were closing borders and things. And um, I actually think the toilet paper scare started in Australia. So that's the, the level of intelligence I'm dealing with around here. But, um, I joked about it and, and I think it was right to, to say, I mean, I live miles from the nearest supermarket. So like every shop is a pandemic shop for me. I, like, I'm not going, it's not nearby, right? So um, we had a whole bunch of stuff, as you say, on hand. And that's a thing you can do. And it's it's a... Um, and uh, like we're dealing with this with the members I've had in the private member area guests on board who are specialists in canning and, and, um, and one of them had um, her husband lost his job um, after 9-11 and so they didn't have any money and she's like well they lived on the food she had in hand for six months because <laughs> she's like well I got six months of food like we'll we'll get through it and they did and and I, I think it's a really powerful step along with in the northern hemisphere using this summer to um become as holistically healthy and, and have a, an immune system that you can kind of take to the bank as much as possible. There are th whatever you think is going on, both of those steps seem correct to me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. hundred percent. I mean, yeah, that's, I want to take control of my food supply as much as possible. Yeah. This year. That's a good one. Um, 
the other thing is I think we're seeing the like merger of, you know, there's this like, I'm sure it doesn't, I mean, I picked up the thing in, in the Dune books, but there's this like thing where, where you need to get, you want the ruling class to be, you want, you need your science or you need your religion and your politics to sort of be aligned. And then that's when you can really have control over a population. And I think that's kind of what we're starting to see with science mm. and this rise of the technocracy is now, you know, first it was, um, you know, the killing God or whatever, killing spirituality and letting science take the place of that. And now we're seeing, you know, now we've got basically people who are running computer models are able to tell us that we can't leave our house. And even countries that have constitutions and bills of rights that say you're not allowed to do that are suddenly circumvented by this weird sort of things of legislation where science is now creeping into your I don't know. I think well, it's not actual science, though. But it's it's they say. Well, that's it's what science, I mean. It's yeah. going to be this monolith that's yeah. this religious and political deity that we now yeah. all bow to. Yeah. yeah, it's um, it's not just in June. One of the things I thought was interesting is in the Socratic dialogues. Right? They it's it's a bunch of uh, elite men um, sitting around essentially spitballing how they get the hoi polloi to fight their wars, and back then, so you're talking like 500 um, BC. They're like, well, we'll invent a state religion. And they end, they end up with like a earth religion, like a earth mother religion, as how do you get the hoi polloi to fight your wars? And you, people forget that the super elite study this stuff when they go to the, <laughs> the schools. Like everyone, everyone knows Plato. Um, and it's kind of funny that it's not funny in a good way, but there is a way you can realize that process is going on. And, and I, it's morning here, right? So I woke up to the, um, the ridiculous fast that was socially distanced Democrats in their 70s. I don't know if you've seen a video of them trying to get up, um, taking a knee, wearing their little masks. And if you think that's politics, you're like, I can't help you yet. But um, that's a really good example where the, the, the background now, and it's all true. Like I'm, I'm all for like um, ending police brutality. I, I'm, I, I'm a pacifist anarchist. You absolute, like a police force is a new idea. Um, there are other ways of, of managing that as communities. I'm a hundred percent on board with the actual heart part of the protest. Right. By the same token, yeah. um, in the background, you have the, um, the, the sort of centrist politics trying to equate that scientifically with the other parts of their op, right? So um, uh, white supremacy causes climate change is in the back of that. And it's, it's to Darren's point, which is like, look, that's, um, how to say this, that's a religion. That is a state religion. <laughs> Both of these things, like ecological destruction, I don't, after Charles Eisenstein, I don't use climate change because I don't think the word is even strong enough and, and it's all computer game model things. I think we're destroying the planet in a, in a more alarming sense. Um, but also that dialogue around carbon yeah, dioxide yeah. traps you in, in a technocratic model of solutionism. So it's all a mess, right? So we all, we all know that, right? Cool, that's good. So white supremacy exists and destroying the planet exists, but if you put them together and use these terms and equate it to this ritualistic behavior that suits a power elite, um, that's the thing, this is what I mean. People are trying to lose, people are losing or realizing that's wrong at the same time as they're implementing that. And that's, they're trying to navigate two challenges at once. And, uh, and I don't know, I don't know what, how, what, what do we do? Fix it for me again. How is that not blackface? How is that not blackface? Well, speaking of, um, that's what I thought when I saw Trudeau, um, you know, <laughs> Trudeau doing a Black Lives Matter protest. That's my avatar in the chats right now is Trudeau's, is Trudeau's blackface, the one where he has his tongue out. And all this stuff, I mean, we again, we've worked out that politics um, is a performative sham. We worked it out before it became life-threatening really and people now having to do that but i can't he makes, yeah. i yeah. can't even for him to allegedly spend all the time when he's got a six-figure government salary in his house except when he doesn't want to in house arrest and then for him to put that mask on and, and a trust fund i can't but like do you not i mean you guys do but like do you not remember a couple of months ago when it's like oh no it turns out like blackface is his hobby it wasn't even just once <laughs> i i can't and it's and he's just an example. I mean, he's one amongst. He is how they operate. Do you know what I mean? It's it's different rules for him than us. 
Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty overt now. Yeah. It's pretty overt. The, mm-hmm. the the hypocrisy is overt. They t- saying on the news and putting these 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 bullet points out that you can't have a social gathering. You can gather in in twelve social gathering of twelve unless you're protesting against the cops. Then a hundred is okay. I mean, people are going to start to see through that you hypocrisy. Can't protest pretty against good. stay at home orders. You can't. <laughs> like, you can, so now they're telling you how you, can, you they're telling you that it's okay and it's safe to protest among many many people unless you're in you know as long as you're protesting the the proper thing. Trudeau's protesting his own government. Yeah, yeah. Like he's the head of the state that he's protesting. Yeah. Right? And I mean, Canadian cops aren't. You know, we've got our problems, but we don't have a huge problem in Canada. We, our problem in Canada is mostly with the, it's, it's the letting, way that the government letting, treats the indigenous that's, populations. That's, that's what the but real are problem is. Are you guys getting, because one of the things that I did, I did find inspiring. It pays us a lot of lip yeah. service. So Australia has taken the Black Lives Matter thing in the direction that I think um, that is good for our country because we have a very serious issue with indigenous deaths in custody. And that's been the kind of, and again, it's sort of like police brutality in the U S like that's a real thing that I'm, I'm super happy to see people centering with their protests and, and all the rest of it. It's, it, it's, it's, yeah. we have yeah. a, we have a center, right. Oh, they're all idiots, but like just incandescently incompetent prime minister at the moment and the center right. So our liberal party has always been the like, no, we're not. They're typically more racist, put it that way. And, and the idea that this is being the opportunity to have that national discussion and change it is, is one of the exciting side effects of what is, it can be two things, right? Like there's an op going on, but I'm, I'm super happy that part of that op requires us to have a national conversation about our um, deaths in custody, which is police brutality. It's just not the way Americans do it with tanks and guns. <laughs> there seems to be like a vaccine issues that are bubbling to the surface. I was just going to say, I was too. just going to say a bunch of like backfires. The overreach, the over, there's way too much overreach on them and their, and their push for global vaccines. I and mean, a lot of people are starting to wake up and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, <laughs> I don't want this if they haven't been tested. But do you think, I mean, that's, that's the world that people are losing, right? So uh, having just, and I think it's right to do so earlier in the episode, say like, we don't actually know what's going on. And we, we certainly hope to have the humility to, to own that. Um, but with that, in, yeah. with that being said, what do you think is going on? Like we begin with like, well, uh, and I, I think overreach is, well, I'll start, right? So there is a, and it's just easy to say technocratic. Um, there is an attempt to bring forward as much of the kind of like technocratic hit points as possible, as fast as possible. And my guess as to why actually comes from Whitney Webb, where she was doing the um, FOIA work on the US national security assessment of China's ability to use things like AI. And because they were a little bit ahead, they're like, oh, well, we need to beat China. So it's like, we have to beat China at being like a technocratic totalitarian regime. And so what I think is going on is an attempt to try to get as much of human life in the West on the kind of digital rails that they run. So it's a hit on, if they got everything they wanted, it'd be a UBI. Oh my God. <laughs> right. If they- I've never heard it that bad before. Well, the Whitney Webb stuff is there, right? But here's, the good news is every time they do this. Hey, Gordon, we can't, uh, we lost yet. We lost yet Whitney Webb. Yeah, just, cool. and it's, it's, yeah. You're a complete so, robot right now. Whitney- Speaking of the technical. Yeah. We lost yet Whitney there Webb. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Lost yeah. me at Whitney Webb. It keeps happening. So, um, it, uh, in March, maybe it was that she had the um, the FOIA documents that shows the national security, U.S. national security assessment that China is ahead of them in the use of automation in AI, or, or would be would like beat them to some goals by like 2030 or whatever. So the guess is, um, a lot of what's going on is an attempt to kind of like catch up. And and the the hilarious thing is because they don't want China to be better at them than being a totalitarian regime. Um, they're going to like run ahead with it. But each time this happens, they throw as much as possible at a situation and you can decide for yourself whether it was engineered from the beginning or it was a yeah. crisis of opportunity. So yeah. same thing with 9-11 where five seconds later, here is this entire bill that comes with the Patriot Act, it's thousands of pages, all these things clearly prepared beforehand. Same thing with, um, you know, the 
corona situation, version one of the um, the bailouts had universal basic income. It had all these things in it. Yeah. And it didn't get through. And so they, they try to get, yeah. um, it's throwing as much at the wall with each thing to see what sticks. And that's like, I view that as good news because it, it means you do have the opportunity to... You, you, you can't fall into immediate despair for two reasons. First of all, they show their hand at the beginning. Like, they did. They showed their hand at the beginning. It's like, well, we need, we need to uh, mandatory vaccines that have this chip, and we need universal basic income, and we need all this kind of stuff. Like, here is my letter to Santa, right? Um, <laughs> and so, they, they, well, that's not very good. But the good news is, with all of these cases, and just with life in general, they don't all land. Because, one, some of them are impossible. But two, like then it's just like the battle is joined at that point. So it's, it's like doubly good news. You kind of see what they're trying to do, but the good news is there's wiggle room. There's opportunity <laughs> to, to push back or even see it coming. So that seems to be the, that's my map of, of what I think is going on. And it's a map that underpins the previous, it, it kind of stitches together um, the, the, the previous version of the pandemic up, which was the kind of like um, Paris Accords, Greta version of it. And then there's this bit. And then p- parts of the riots thing, I'm certainly not um, saying all of it in the slightest. Um, but you, you kind of see they're trying to get as much of this stuff to stick as possible. And that's kind of what I think is going on. I don't know, what do you guys think? Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. Um... I mean, I, in a lot of ways, I think we could also be looking at some sort of weird modern warfare where you've got this, like, you, the West is sort of this weird animal where we're free and anyone can come in and start buying up property or doing this or having social media accounts where we got these weird new bot animals. And I just think just this weird new way to sow a whole bunch of dissent inside a country and then maybe, like, I mean, I, I'm with you on the China-US. I just think that a lot of this could be, um, you know, modern warfare operating inside the U.S. where you see like this virus is being maybe wave one and riots is being wave two. And I think, uh, I think it's been planned, uh, like you said, Gordon, and, and everything's thrown at the wall. But in 2010, it was the decade of vaccines and 2020 is when, when it hits. It's too coincidental for me. I think they're trying for the global, the global control, the global tracking, like this, all, everything else has failed except for the false flag alien invasion, which might still happen, but they're really, the global warming thing was supposed to have that, the common enemy. That's not, that's not coming to fruition. Uh, this is the next level of, of tracking. And I, and I do think that the riot, the riots were wave two. I think a lot of that is, is they were ready for that. I don't, I don't believe that that was organic at all. I think people are jumping on be, for good reason because of all the things you talked about and all the things we talked about, about, you know, the cop, there is a problem with the cops and there's a problem with police brutality and racism. And I think that most of that is engineered as well. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be the dystopian technocratic future if they want it. I mean, a friend of mine, he doesn't trust the government. He doesn't trust the cops, but he doesn't, he doesn't have a problem with this global, um, global plan and i'm like how can you how can you scale up that trust or oh, that distrust so how can you how can you become trustful at a global a level times a negative equals that's, a what positive. that's what it is <laughs> well that's but that's kind of the um the goldilocks approach of the technocratic technocratic plan right so it turns out the thing that like this one is just right it turns out the thing that people are more scared of than global warming um is this you know, coronavirus. Right. So they've actually found yeah. the thing that will get people to move in fear because the goal was the same. If you actually look at what, if they'd managed to mobilize people, the, the, this is one of the other reasons why the, um, the global warming thing is so interesting to billionaires with private jets is um, the way you were going to quote unquote solve that was to run uh, the essentially governments are funded by um, bond sales, right? So you switch to a process where governments get, Um, funding like drawdown funding based on carbon compliance so you essentially are running how governments work and it's how the west the g7 has um 
are only about 20% of the projected growth versus G20 over the next 50 years. So the question becomes how G7 manages a G20 growth world. And it's this, right? Like to plan A was carbon compliance and how that works is you have to have smart homes and you have to have approval to get on planes and certain distances and all that. So that the technocratic technology was going to run on carbon compliance and it didn't work. No one cared. <laughs> no one cared enough. Um, they care about this. And you'll notice that the, um, the solutions are all the same, which is like, you need uh, immunity passports to travel, which is, you know, carbon. Yeah. Um, you need, yeah. you need approval to move certain distances and, and all the rest of it. And, and they, they found the thing that is, can mobilize enough people in fear to, to get it to work. And this is in play. Same thing with the riots. I, I hate calling them riots because that's like a right wing flashpoint. Like there are legitimate protests. So we'll call them protests. Um, it, whatever you think of what's going on or how, however dangerous you think coronavirus is, and same thing with however you choose to frame ecological destruction, whether you think carbon dioxide is like the thermostat for a planet and, and whatever, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you land on the reality of these things. You see the, you see the solutions being presented at Davos and the World Economic Forum and the rest of it as the same. <laughs> so this is the kind of tragic thing of your friend going like, I'm deeply suspicious of the government, but for some reason, the billionaire who didn't even invent DOS, I'm cool with? What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And he wants to spray, uh, you know, spray stuff and block the sun at the same time. I mean, if that's not alarming to people, I, I don't know what is that they think that that's that geoengineering solutions fake meat place yeah. yeah well so that's yeah. a really good example so um when you look at um the changes to the food supply it, it it fits in with these things which is you you will have to have approval to eat um animal protein um because of carbon reasons even though that's as as a regenerative um permaculture type person it's scientifically wrong um we need more animals not less but i'm sure um darren you'd agree it's not even the point the point is how you how do you get like how do you get people to see and detach from the story and their opinion of it i don't know i, I think it's good i think this is I think people are there and, and, and they are maybe just struggling, as I am clearly, to articulate it. I think they know somewhere in their heads <laughs> their version of what we're saying. Um, some of them do. I've, yeah. I've been disappointed yeah. in, in, in friends and colleagues who, as, as more and more people are waking up, they seem to get even nastier, um, sticking to the kind of neoliberal centrist talking point cover story and i'm, I'm a bit alarmed yeah. by that what do we do with yeah that? that'll happen though yeah because yeah. that's the thing is like as people start to doubt as people start to doubt and try to repress it it's gonna be presented as fanaticism i think for a little bit so i think in the case of people in who are allegedly in like an alternative world who are still sticking to the science of social distance and this this virus is going to kill millions of people and all those sort of official talking points i think they're reacting in fear because they're losing that world you know that, that 90s conspiracy world where it's all kind of harmless i think the outward projection of vitriol to people um, who are, and more and more people, I would argue the majority of people have moved away from the official position, but for some reason in like alternative media land, there are <laughs> a diminishing number of like vitriolic voices that are kind of trying to keep, trying to police the official position. I think it's because they're afraid that, I think it's a fear-based response to the fact that, holy shit, that world I thought I lived in like where can not I hate saying conspiracy, but like alternate viewpoints as a kind of wacky hobby might actually be a real thing. And I don't know. Is, is that your your because some of us haven't exactly covered ourselves in glory over the over the course of this process, which brings me neatly back to what our role as as voices in it even is. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, I do know what you mean. I, I don't know if I've experienced too much of the alternative or independent media that I digest um, doing what you say. I've, I've felt more of a cohesive questioning community than that. So I'm not too sure about that aspect of it. It might be more like a magic and astrology thing, but carry on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, now that you put it that way, yes, I, I do he's see. Not on I, Twitter, though, I do see thing. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Graham's not on uh, Twitter, so he hasn't seen. Uh, I, right, right, I right. definitely agree with you. Okay, good. <laughs> well, there's was- all these people who are like in on every conspiracy, except you know they get to a certain line where it's like everything past that's crazy, but everything up to there, you can't trust them. But at that line, that's okay. COVID, yeah. why go COVID? Stay home, bro. <laughs> Actually, okay. I know. I now I see what you mean when because I when I think about it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got pushed. I mean. We, we kind of went head first into COVID. We didn't even really mean to. We kind of talked about how we weren't going to do that. And then we sort of spent four weeks just crashing the COVID narrative, which came with a whole bunch of pushback from shows that probably, and I'll just use shows as a thing because there was a bunch of other podcasts, I won't name any of them, that are in our genre that you know have never had a problem with any of our posts. And I post some pretty fucking wild shit sometimes. Never, never get too much pushback until you start pushing back on social distancing and masks and the COVID narrative. Then people that you know telling us, you know, we yeah, but we took we took responsible. But we took our time getting there, though. I mean, I was I spent a couple of weeks in fear when I when I oh, friends no, of mine read this. You were back and forth in fear for a while, but I'm just saying, like these people that consider this, themselves alternative, yeah suddenly became the covid cops yeah and that that's the bit i and and it's a real fear reaction because sure i mean i get people and i don't care like i get people who disagree with me and or like oh well i'm not i'm not that interested in this stuff so i'm not going to listen to that one or whatever who cares but it was uh, the the vitriol come comes from a place of fear and and i thought that was interesting um that there and, and that as you say there's a line where you can talk about alien hybrids and it's cool um but if you and 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 I think it's getting although they're they're quieter I think they're meaner at the moment as it turns out I don't want to it's not like a turns out we were the position that we were exploring or whatever is is um more correct or less inaccurate is safer right so like the CDC's um, if you if you put together their um, infected mortality rate with the estimated uninfected you get a 0.2 0.26 like so like bad flu rate right so it's sort of that is now yeah. their official numbers and even though the fucking it was we all know like the actual measurement of of, of what counts as a case or is overblown mess, right yeah. so yeah. but even yeah. by their own kind of messy numbers and and look medicine is messy healing is messy it's cool um and that's kind of what i meant not I, that I, messy no that's valid um, but i i think I, I spent some time working out why people, why this was their line, and not just that, but why their pushback was so um, venomous. And and I think it's because they're losing that underlying world. I think it's because in that kind of California, Bob Wilson thing where, you know, their version of being edgy is like to be a California Democrat. I think they think that's the world. And now that that's clearly not the world, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like that's not, it turns out that's not an accurate map for reality. I think a it's lot like of finding out about Santa Claus, you're pissed for a second. Yeah, exactly. And I, I kind of think like that you like, but thanks for the stuff. I kind of think that's what happened. And, I, and so I, for me, I've been sitting with why that happened. And also not, responsibility is the wrong word, but what, what's the best way to respond? And I think it's kind of like with patience. <laughs> I think it's almost like a turn the other cheek because they've lost, they're doing two things, right? They're experiencing fear and uh, they're losing a world and they're being um, horrible at the same time. So for me, I'm like, okay, well, they've probably lost their world by now, <laughs> I think. Uh, and, and does that make sense? Is that, that's kind of how I've been framing the... We, we've lo- we lost you again on that reply. That's it. All right, so another dropout, but that's cool. Um, I want to kind of move the discussion towards the final air, not, uh, I was going to say final solution, improper use of words for, for the discussion we just had. The last topic I want to have is to head in a positive direction. So... Um, what are we, what are you doing? What are we like, what are you doing to make the world better? We were talking about how we, how we discuss things with, with loved ones and so on, but, uh, how, what are you going to do now? Like, what are things that we can do to make the world less shit? <laughs> well, I think 
that as the world tries to become more and more fractured and they're trying to divide us on age and race and gender and whatever else they can figure out, um, sexual preference, you name it. I think at least for me personally, <clears throat> what's important to me, I mean, we had to actually, I think for the first time in a long time, we, before we recorded an intro last week, we had to discuss how we were going to approach certain things. And because, I mean, we're, we're human, so we've got opinions and on politics and on all this stuff. But I think what we decided was the most, and it kind of plays off your thing about not yelling at people to get them to listen to you, is not to be anything that's pushing any more division as much as possible. I mean, the, that, that I think is the main thing you can do, whether that's just you personally you know, being kind to someone who doesn't agree with you and not getting triggered because somebody doesn't have the same politics as you, not getting triggered because they have a different opinion from the meme that's going around as you. And just, I mean, it just, it's real tolerance instead of pretend make-believe tolerance. It's real tolerance for different opinions instead of different people, you know, because I think, I think that, you know, and that doesn't, that's not to say you not to have tolerance for other people, but I think, you know, in, in my honest opinion, and, you know, I might regret saying this, but I think when it comes to being tolerant with other people, we've come a long fucking way in the last 30, 40, 50 years. Like, in, there was a chance that I ended up in a residential school, for fuck's sakes. I mean, the last one closed in Saskatchewan less than 30 years ago. So 40 years ago, I'm 39, 40 years ago, you could be born on a reserve and taken to another school, taken away from your parents and indoctrinated in Western culture. That was like in 1990s, in the 1990s, those things are still operating in Canada. And I mean, if I look at, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s in the US, at some of the stuff that was going on there between the races. And I mean, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. And I'm, a, I'm an Indian and I come from this culture that's sort of dealing with missing women and all this stuff. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it for another time. You know, maybe I'd trade it for before everyone showed up, but maybe I wouldn't because I like some of the stuff that's here now. Um, I don't know. I can't make that choice. But what I can sort of decide is that I wouldn't want it to be 40 years ago or I wouldn't want it to be 60 years ago as a minority in Canada. I wouldn't have wanted it to be a hundred years ago. So. Oh, I dropped out again. <clears throat> Hopefully it'll come back. Yeah, you're Yay. back. Yeah. So it's just, a, maybe we just need to be patient for a little bit longer and let all this shit, like, cause a lot of shit's happened in the last 30 years. Maybe we just need to let this shake out and settle down and let some old people retire. And, you know, let's like, let's, let's just wait. 10 or 15 years before we burn everything down. Nice one. Radical togetherness from Darren. Um, Graham, what do you reckon? How are we? And I guess I'll, I'll preface it this way, and, and I don't want to front load your answer or anything. Uh, we all kind of said this, like we're not going to talk about the virus or we're not going to talk about the protests continuously. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we did an okay job of it. I, I make sure to put episodes and things out that aren't about it. And I know you guys do too. So, um, so Graham, how, are you, how do we make the world better individually? And, and also in that wider sense of is, is part of that having other discussions? Uh, many people use all right. Any luck? Uh, yes. Yeah, we're back. All right. So, um, well, actually, it's, in a way, it's a convenient spot. Um, Graham, have a go. <laughs> we'll see if it records. Yeah, I, well, I, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, I've been, I've been wondering, like, sometimes I just feel like disengaging from everything. I mean, it just feels a bit, uh, sometimes it feels a bit overwhelming. But I think to continue doing this and talking about the difficult topics in a compassionate and, and, and loving way, I think is one way. The other way I think is to, I'm not going to buy into this violence is the answer thing. I think that the peaceful, peaceful protesting is the way to go. I just feel like pushing back a little bit harder on that saying that, no, there's no excuse for the violence. I mean, you can't uh, be protesting a death and, and cause a bunch more deaths and think it's, it's, you know, it's not somewhat hypocritical. I don't, I don't agree with the violence part of it. So I think pushing, uh, pushing what we do in a peaceful way would be beneficial. 
And then for myself, for myself being more of the change and, and, and being more of a, coming back to more of a personal, spiritual and physical healthy routine for me will help me uh, in, in what I, what I do here with Darren. So I need to get back to a, get to back to more of a, a healthy regiment myself. I am. Um, the gyms are finally reopened in Tasmania for a maximum of 40 people. So I'm going to do the gym for the first time since early March after we finish recording. And I'm, I'm quite looking forward awesome. to it. Awesome. Quite looking forward yeah. to it. So yeah. um, lucky last question. Why the Moai for the symbol for the show? Oh man, you know what? That's, that's kind of fitting that, that we end with that question because it wasn't even anything to do with us. It was just our friend of the show, um, RPJ, Miguel. You know, we were close with them uh, through the Mysterious Universe community and a few others. And we told him we were starting a podcast. And at first he said, no, he wasn't going to do the art for us. He was too busy. And then like 24 hours later, he sent me the picture with the art. Oh, nice. And, um, you yeah. know, that's, and, and it was just seeing it and it just seemed perfect. And it's just been around ever since. And it's kind of, it's interesting because different politics have kind of driven a wedge in that relationship. So if you're out there, RPG, we still love you just because we disagree with you on most things. Doesn't mean we don't love you. And I, and, and, and that art artwork that when I saw it, I thought I had seen it before for sure. I thought this, I've seen this before. I got this feeling about it. And I said to red, I was like, red, where'd you get that from? Like that's, I've seen that. And, and he's like, I just made it up. So it really resonated with me at a, on a deep level as well, just with the headphones and the UFO and all that as well. And, and I thought that uh, that was very fitting. So it was a good start. Yeah, it's, um, it is a good start. It's funny how these things kind of get pulled out of the ether because it's got the, the, the sort of ancient civilization angle to it and, and all the rest of it. It's funny how that works, isn't it? Like I was always interested in Bruno, Giordano Bruno. Yeah. And I wasn't sure why. And that was kind of the motif for the blog and then the show. And the more I think about it, it's like he's basically – um, Italy's first ufologist in a way because he's he ended up being burned for his, <laughs> yeah. his um he's a, he's a magician clearly but like he ended up being burned because he refused to kind of step down from the idea that the universe is infinite and that there are infinite stars like little lamps and there might even be other planets around these little stars and or other civilizations around them so he was kind of accidentally uh accidentally a, a, a ufologist as well as a kind of like um yeah, a, a very um, angry music, uh, magician type. So it's funny, it just kind of, it, it pulls it from the future in some way. But guys, um, super fun chat. Uh, it's, it was quite medicinal for me, to be perfectly honest, too. Uh, as I was chatting to Greg, same thing, like, ah, how are you doing? And, and to kind of see that we're all um, running through the same sort of thoughts and the same sort of thinking and, and situating about how, what we do individually and what we do professionally and, and all the rest of it. So, so big ups on that. And in the sort of somewhat unlikely chance that people don't know where to find you, where do they find you? Uh, Grammarica.ca. That's, you know, that'll get you pretty well ever. I mean, if the, the interesting thing about having a terrible branding name like Grammarica is if you just type that into <laughs> Google, we'll own like the first 10 pages. <laughs> It was all planned. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. It was a uh, um, super fun chat, and it was really good to have a have a have a have a Commonwealth conversation. Without bothering to look into it too deeply, uh, from memory, it was Zizek who originally said that the end of the world is easier to imagine than the end of capitalism. And that sort of came up tangentially in today's episode. You see that, for instance, in the greenwashing solutionism of Davos environmentalism, right? So either corporations get money, either the corporations that cause the damage in the first place get money to build wind farms or the world ends in 10 years, right? And it's that even when the impulse is a righteous one, uh, it is often and most of the time still entirely defined by the reality parameters of the problem. And even using the term problem implies there is a solution, right? So you're still stuck in that solutionistic, mechanistic fixing, right? So Zizek meant, meant it, as far as I can tell, that oppositionally defined positions require their villain to perpetuate. So to be anti-capitalist 
is to fail to get beyond the idea of that capitalism must exist in some form, right? So you are defined by the thing you don't like. And I think there's something in there about how we talk about and what we do in this moment. This is Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble, which I've been on about since the book came out. Um, to engage solutionistically or oppositionally, oppositionalistically, oppositionally, empowers the thing you are attempting to circumvent on your way towards utopia, right? So this is Philip K. Dick, to fight the empire is to be infected by its derangement, right? And I think that describes something like identitarianism um, and purity mobs to a T, right? Where it conflates the existence of a problem with its own preferred solution. And that's what states do, right? So infected by derangement. I vaguely remember describing it to Greg on THC a few years back, that it's like a couple of lines of faulty programming code uh, that repeat themselves on a loop, right? So sort of line one, racism or homophobia or some other problem exists, right? Line two, initiate identitarian response um, of purity spiral. Line three, if any pushback at all is experienced, interpret this as, a, as the problem getting worse and return to line one and play the loop, right? And I think part of staying with the trouble is that for all these challenges we seek to overcome and again look how easy we fall into solutionistic language right call it the collective unconscious or just call it this moment um for whatever reason has chosen being infected by imperial derangement um, as its one strategy and unfortunately it will fail <laughs> so what is a what does a better approach look like i mean beyond Beyond staying with the trouble, beyond a return to non-synthetic versions of relationality, it's just true that the next steps on the road to utopia are non-obvious because they are emergent, right? You only see it when you do it, and that's the end run around solutionism. So I don't know what that looks like for you. But I can't know what it looks like for you. Um, but it is my new content policy, question mark? for what we discuss on the show. I think an emergent trouble staying is an end run around both the toxins and their antibodies. Because here's the thing, having all the episodes centering a weaponized narrative or completely ignoring the narrative because it's weaponized, you see, either way, the show is still defined by the controllers. It's that capitalist, anti-capitalist, Zizek self-perpetuation, right? And, you know, I think I arrived at this, I'm just going to um, vainly call it an editorial position, unconsciously beforehand. And it took doing the show to articulate it because really the only thing that I can tell you will operationally change for certain is sort of shorter lead times for most of the episodes. For years, they'd come out every Thursday, but for most of 2020, it's been weekly on a Thursday dish, right? Um, I don't think we're in a world where, not just mine, I don't think that we're in a world where podcasts can have a six week lead time around a book launch anymore. Um, or at least that's now a rarity in the form rather than the norm, right? This conversation, like I said, it's not even three weeks old and it missed an entire secession. <laughs> um, the other part of staying with the trouble, I think, is staying with the right trouble. A few of you have actually commented that I no longer end the episodes with my Twitter handle anymore. And like a few friends of mine who may surprise you, um, I'm endeavoring to spend less time on Twitter overall, frankly, and for reasons that should be obvious to anyone who uses it in any capacity. <laughs> and you know what? We always knew this day would come. It happened to MySpace, albeit differently. Uh, it happened to Facebook for everyone but the boomers. And it's happening to Twitter now, right? So putting my former professional hat on, if you're, on, if you're kind of like, I don't know, wondering which ship the rats are going to escape to next, there isn't one. In my formerly professional opinion, Twitter will likely be the last of the open social networks. Messaging apps already have more daily active users around the world than Facebook and Twitter combined. So the move has actually happened. The shift has happened. The social media future is your spicy DM rooms. And that's a nice thought to end on. Mm -hmm.